Right, we're ready, Josh. Ready whenever you are. Alrighty. Let's try this again then. Hello, everyone. I'm waving, but you can't see it because I'm not on a camera. Excellent. So, my name is Josh Hammond. I'm a senior security consultant here at IO Active, and I published a paper uh, middle of last year on our vehicle vulnerability research. So, Corey Thuin uh, published a paper in 2015 kind of trying to put together with the number of vehicle assessments we've seen, what are some trends we've seen, you know, what are common problems, and really, how do we do better? So I took our data from 2016 and 2017, I put that all together, and really I tried to do a comparison of, you know, now that we have a baseline, how are things improving, how are things changing as the industry grows, both in terms of technology and, of course, in terms of security. So let's jump right in. So we did over 6,000 hours of embedded vehicle work in 2016 and 2017, and that's just vehicle hardware. So I've got an ECU or a head unit or, or some part of the vehicle in my lab. We've also done a bunch of the back-end testing and the mobile apps and all of those other fun integrations that we see in cars these days. We've worked with a large variety of manufacturers and vendors, um, ranging not only from just you know a traditional pen test, but also talking through what is their security model, how are they trying to address modern problems, and then of course our work, you can't really do just embedded work anymore. The hardware has secure boot on there, and if I can break that, I can get into the application space. If I can get into the application space, then I can look at pivoting into their backend into all the cloud-connected things. So it really takes a, a large team with a lot of different uh, skill sets there to really assess these types of, of engagements. When we're looking at a car, we've got a whole host of things to look at. Um, we've seen a lot more buy-in from vehicle manufacturers to look at even the hardware side. So when I started doing vehicle testing about three years ago, it wasn't common for any of their memory to be encrypted. So you could just read off a chip, you have all of their, their passwords and secrets and, and their entire file system, no problem. Now they are actually trying to address those issues. There's uh, some devices with secure boot, some going as far as running all of the applications inside a hypervisor, and we need to look at breaking all of those hardware level protections to get just the initial foothold on there. Then we need to step up and look at the local connections, so things like the CAN bus and the USB, I know there have been a lot of fun attacks of I just plug this USB in and it doesn't handle odd USBs well. And then, of course, the CAN side is a little more difficult. We need to look at really how the CAN is separated between secure and insecure components. So te uh, typically, modern vehicles have divided CANs for, for different levels of security, and we need to look at passing those boundaries. We need to look at all the devices' applications. Um, I think every vehicle I've seen in the past year has had some form of over the air update on it, and no one does it right the first time. The first rollout of anyone's firmware update is going to have a vulnerability that's going to get you root. And then, of course, they have a bunch of custom applications, and there's a big concern in vehicles, or at least from vehicle manufacturers, about extracting personal info, things like being able to connect to the Bluetooth and see the previous person's contact list things we'd like to avoid here. Another step up, we need to look at the networking. So almost every vehicle these days has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth in it. Um, we've, of course, got Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, just all of these different local services that you might be able to connect to if, you know, maybe you're in an Uber, someone would give you the Bluetooth connection or the Wi-Fi connection to play music or what have you, and those are getting to be bigger concerns. And then, of course, we need to look at the remote network connectivity. Again, just about every vehicle I've seen has had a cellular link in it. HD radio is getting more popular. 
uh, more modern radio standards include things like, hey, when I get this FM radio broadcast, it can include a URL in it. That URL can help me look up album art and lyrics and all that. And that's, of course, an exciting attack vector to look at. And then uh, various satellite connections and other kind of custom connections in there as well. Eventually, we'd love to look at the vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle and vehicle-to-whatever systems, um, just because I personally think that'll be a really fun space, and given everyone's tendency to not do it right the first time, I think we're going to have a lot of fun there. When we approach these engagements, generally we have limited resources, so a very few components are made actually by the vehicle manufacturer, the OEM. A lot are tier ones. So they're provided by another company. And so trying to ask for, for source code or debugging or even multiple units can be difficult. We do like to ask for debugging just because it helps get us a foothold. We don't want to take the six months that a real world attacker might take to find and develop these exploits. We want to find them as quickly as possible. And another advantage this gives us is sometimes these debugging functions aren't super well locked down. So having an example of like, hey, this plugs into the USB and this is how you get debugging on the device can be nice for figuring out, wait a minute, is this actually locked down? Or is this just supposed to be an obfuscation of people don't know there's debugging there? Documentation in vehicles is really exciting in that sometimes if we're lucky, we get a good functional breakdown of what it's supposed to do. But I don't think I've ever seen a detailed architecture of how a vehicle is supposed to be secured, which is, you know, encouraging. And then, of course, we have a lab full of fun toys and smart people here, so I end up working with a, a good-sized team where we can we have hardware experts and, and people who love soldering and modifying parts and all of that good stuff. When we get one of these, we need to look at, of course, the basics. Most of these are running either Linux or QNX, um, so going through just the basic stuff like firewall rules. There were often a couple of problems there. We need to look at the data. Um, we really like to focus on realistic attacks. So I, I hate seeing, hey, there's a buffer overflow here, unless there's a context of how we can reach that. So if I can't send data from you know, some point right across a security barrier and be able to take advantage of that, it really doesn't mean anything to me that hey, this can write one byte off of that buffer. Uh, it's all about context there. And then, of course, we always look at custom applications. No one does it right the first time. Signing, encryption, um, even basic things like certificates. We've seen all sorts of problems where people don't, you know, check the signature and common name on a certificate, the two things that make it worthwhile in the first place. When we do identify vulnerabilities, we need to go through our impact and likelihood. And these are really the, the numbers we'll get into of uh, how things have changed since 2015. So particularly in the vehicle space, we're concerned about safety and privacy. So anything that would allow extracting data about the users or that would, of course, impact the functionality of the vehicle is going to be a very significant impact there. Likelihood, we need to go into things like how much effort is it going to take to develop an attack? Is this something where, like, I need hardware access to a device, or do they have something exposed over their network that they shouldn't? Those type of things just give an idea of, of how challenging it might be to pull this off. We need to look at how hard it is to fix. Um, even very critical uh, vulnerabilities can end up being simple fixes, as, as I mentioned with certificates. We've seen before where someone basically just put in the argument, don't check common names, and the fix was real easy. Set it to check common names, right? <laughs> Sometimes these are, are really simple, 
And sometimes it gets into larger architecture. So if, if a communication protocol is broken, fixing that protocol and then updating everything to have the right key material to be synced correctly to still be able to talk could be a big challenge. And then of course, all of that is, is great, but it's all about the details. When we go in and we describe a vulnerability, if it's not easy to understand, if there aren't clear steps on how we found it and how it could be found again and how it could be fixed, we haven't really done our job there. So uh, we love to go into just overboard technical details there. Um, but let's talk about the numbers. Yay, data. So we've seen a 15% decrease in critical impact. So of the vulnerabilities we found in 2016 and 2017 versus our 2014 and 2015 data, 15% less have a critical impact. Uh, the likelihood has increased in critical and low categories. So the medium category kind of went down and it shifted off to either side. Now, my thinking on this is that we've seen kind of two trends going on. One, vehicle manufacturers are trying to do security now. So some of the, the medium risk going down to low is just simple things like privilege separation. If I exploit your Bluetooth, I'm now on a Bluetooth user and not just running as a root. That's, sadly enough, a big change recently. But we've also seen an increase in critical, and I think the, the critical likelihood increase has really been due to the amount of connectivity we've been seeing in vehicles. So, like I said, just about everything has a cell connection now. Everyone's running their own apps. We've seen apps that, you know, have their own update mechanism aside from the firmware update mechanism, and that just ends up in a lot more exposure um, particularly on remotely accessible vulnerabilities. So likelihood has, has kind of split here. We have seen a 16% decrease in the overall rating. So the overall rating uh, accounts for both the impact and likelihood of a vulnerability. So generally things have gotten better. That said, 26 of vulnerabilities percent of vulnerabilities we identified in 2016 and 2017 were due to logic errors. And I like to split out logic errors from memory corruption. So if we had a buffer overflow or you know a, a pointer that we were able to take advantage of to leak some information, that would really be memory corruption. Those are kind of low level technical issues. Logic errors tend to be more in the category of, hey, we authenticate all the messages to this service except this set of them, and some of those may, may allow us to leverage more access into the system. You know, either someone forgot to check something or checked it wrong. This would really be the types of things like not checking the common name on that certificate. It's really an, an error in how we design and implement the security controls rather than a, a really low-lying bug that would get us access to the running process. Of the critical impact vulnerabilities we had, 59% of them were low effort to fix. Now that is down from 77%, but it still means that critical impact vulnerabilities aren't you know, very complicated. I was able to pass from this user space and get a race condition in the kernel and get to the, it's really just simple things like you didn't check this or this is unauthenticated or um, we've had issues with, you know, user sessions where someone attaches to Bluetooth but then disconnects and someone else attaches and it doesn't handle that very well. So a lot of vulnerabilities are still fairly easy to fix. And then 41% of the vulnerabilities would really be fixed by industry best practices. So things like checking the common name, things like checking lengths of buffers to make sure you don't have an overflow, things that you know you could generally look up online on like, hey, 
what does secure coding mean? What do we need to, to check for here? Those types of fixes would fix a large number of, of the findings here. So, you know, there's still a lot of baseline work that needs to go into it. And that actually leads us into our next video. What's the takeaway? So what's the, the sum here? Better design seems to be making vulnerabilities less damaging, so we see less things that can give you just easy access to either root access on the device or to the CAN bus and potentially have you know, physical impacts there. We're seeing better tools kind of competing with stronger security. So things like working with QNX, I've got a whole large tool set they're readily available online. I can, I can load them up and do a lot of my assessment very quickly, which makes some of these vulnerabilities easier to identify and uh, a lower barrier to access here. Better coding and security view review would help prevent a lot of these issues. So things like having secure coding standards, both in the OEM and in the tier one uh, hardware providers would fix a lot of these issues before they even came up. And then network connectivity and new wireless protocols in particular are making for a more complicated environment. So especially as we start getting into the, the V to X, the vehicle to infrastructure area, issues of trusting data and using that data for making potentially safety critical decisions make this a lot more challenging of an environment to work with.